We're back, ladies and gentlemen. It's a brief history of everything. I'm Chris. I'm your host, joined as always by Thomas. Hello. So today we're going to be getting straight into it because we've got a really small topic for you. You know, we're not we're not going into anything too in depth. We're not trying to cover too much. We decided small, chunked, really simple narratives. I think, don't you agree? Oh, if this isn't the simplest uh, historical story we've ever told, I don't know what we're doing. Okay, so exact. So for example, we're going with something simple. Causes of World War One. Now, we can all agree that the cause of World War One was Hitler, just as it was with World War Two and the Vietnam War. Correct? Yeah, he's the he's the blame for everything. Just just Hitler. It's everything. Private Hitler, as he was in World War One. No. If not him, Ralph Nader. <clears throat> Always Ralph Nader and Jill Stein. And Jill Stein. So let's cover it because World War One is quite a complex thing. Um, it's actually it's really interesting for me as someone who teaches World War One as you do, Thomas, trying to explain to students World War One a lot of the time and they don't understand relevance at first and they always like but but what about Nazis? And one of the big things that we always find is we teach World War One to Year Nine and we get but but the Nazis, I want to talk about the Nazis and you're like World War One's beginning. It's the conception f- of the Nazis. It's f- first of all, it's it, World War One explains World War Two. That's part of it. Secondly, and for me, World War One's beginning is far more interesting than anything that starts World War Two. World War Two there is a very linear sort of path and you can see it quite clearly and it, it's not there's not too much debate on what causes World War Two. World War One on the other hand, the fact that we're now over a hundred years since the start of World War One, and nobody agrees hundred percent no. as to what started World War One gives you an idea of what we're dealing with as as a concept and as an issue. Mm. I think when it comes to trying to explain where World War One comes from, it's going to be the litmus test to find out what sort of, um, say, historical school you probably come from. If, like, a regular high school uh, history teacher, you sort of have to approach it like a traditional historian, you know, focus on the, the great man and the pol- politics and the military movement. But if you're sort of more advanced and you go a little bit further if you're saying much more of like a Marxist historian you're going to really focus on the changing uh, machinations of emerging classes and the industrialising processes and you're going to be able to avoid a story of great men in their times and really focus on where the war came from from its roots if you look at it from maybe like an orientalist approach you're going to be able to see that the the factors of imperialism which we will acknowledge are far more important than say the politics of Europe so it's, it's, as I said, a litmus test to sort of see where you are as a historian, what your bent is. And I think, I think it's something that, that, goes, that does bear to be um, understood. You focus on World War I primarily when people look at it from a European perspective. It is a world war. It legitimately is. Yes, majority of the conflict takes place within Europe, but the draw and the focus of the, the people who fight and then the issues that burn post-World War I have a huge bearing, first of all, on World War II in Europe, as we know. But secondly, the nationalist movements that happen in the rest of the world, the overlay of the Pacific War, for example, in, in World War II, a lot of that comes out of dissatisfaction of people with what happens at the end of World War I, how they are treated. You know, countries like India, for example, who go and fight for empire and get nothing out of it and feel destroyed and feel like they've been betrayed by the British. You've got the Japanese who come out of the war going, hang on a minute, we we got absolutely nothing out of this, Um, which leads to a lot of the way Japan decides to treat itself post-World War I. Um, People who study it at a high school level in Australia, for example, hear all about the Anzac legend and the blooding of a nation and all those sorts of things, and we will talk about elements of that as part of nationalism and the way that the war was seen, but we're not going to cover it from an Australian perspective because we are, as much as people don't necessarily want to admit it, we're a minor part of the story. We're an extremely minor part of the story. Um, And what we want to focus on is the war itself, and in particular we're dealing with the run-up to the war. Remember, we appear once Andrew Fisher says, last man, last shilling. That's when we're suddenly a part of this. Up to this point in time, we're just happily minding our own business, pretending we're British in Asia. Yeah, that's that's the way it works. So let's go into the machinations that are taking place within this part of the world. And it's a war that has a lot of... There's a lot that comes out of this war from the past. 
And it is a war that is not something that begins three years earlier. It's not something that begins five years earlier. You can trace the roots of this war. I mean, again, if it's a slippery slope, you can really trace it way, way, way back. But let's go back to the idea of the foundation of Germany. Let's start with the foundation of Germany. Yeah, I think when I look for where World War One starts, you, you can't meaningfully go back beyond, say, 1815 mm. with the Congress of Vienna, yep. the end of the Napoleonic era. Anything before that just sort of muddies the water. It's tenuous. And, yeah, and, and you're just sort of linking all causes to all effects. But at the Congress of Vienna, when Russia... The German states, because it's not necessarily a country yet, um, Great Britain are all starting to go, okay, we now need to remake Europe, and they make essentially the concert of Europe, which is to maintain peace across the continent to avoid you know, a dictator rising up again, the irony, a dictator rising up and controlling the continent at the exclusion of others. Uh, this is probably where the seeds are sown, and then the fertiliser, the fertile ground from which these seeds grow is the unification of Germany. When Bismarck is able, and he's going to be the key player for my mind here, when Bismarck is able to unite all these principalities for under the guidance of militarist Prussia, if this doesn't happen, World War One doesn't happen for my mind at that early stage. While there's many uh, places where you can avoid it uh, and avoid a big war like this, one of those things where it was almost unavoidable is that unification of Germany under Bismarck and Prussia. Yeah, that, pe- that period of time where you get the, the idea of, you know, 1848, 50-ish to 1871 when, you know, it's officially signed, sealed, delivered, and everything is put together, that does lay a large proportion of, of the groundwork of what's going to happen. And, and, and a large reason for this is that it's... Apart from the militaristic side of things, which you talked about with Bismarck, and Bismarck is that larger-than-life figure that Germany that unifies this German state, and it is shaped in his image, and his image is one of war. Um, but I think the other thing that brings about under this unification under Bismarck and the unification of Germany is if you then go, <clears throat> I don't know, west of Germany... And you head to the western side of Germany and there's a major power there who's now suddenly got this huge unified sort of militaristic based state right on its doorstep in France. And France is looking at this situation and going, but hang on a minute, that's, they're going to, our territory is now at at risk because the smaller states were never going to encroach on French territory because they couldn't have. So France looks at this situation and starts thinking to itself, okay, this is troubling. This is a bit worrying. Russia has a look as well and goes, that's a bit worrying as well. And for Russia, the size of that landmass that Russia's dealing with, those little states off to the far west of Russia, are easy to be picked off. So Russia starts getting cautious about the idea of what Germany could possibly do, a unified Germany could do. France gets worried. And, of course, as we know, Germany, one of the first things it does, because when a nation is being blooded, what do you do? Well, you go to war. And the, one of the first things that Germany decides to do is, hey, France, how you going? Let's have a bit of a conflict, shall we? And this is where this distrust starts. This is where this, again, sows this seed of mistrust between Germany and, and, and France, which is really going to govern almost the next 100 years' worth of relations in Europe, this mistrust between Germany and France and this threat of they're always going to do something to us. Yeah, what you're alluding to there is the um, acquisition of Alsace and Lorraine yep. by Germany from France. Alsace known for the Alsatian dogs, which were changed from German Shepherd names Indeed because uh, no one wanted German dogs during the war. And Lorraine, obviously, keeps them. Exactly, Lorraine. and that, that, that's that's you know what what the whole thing was about. Yeah. It's all about food, food. and dogs. Food and dogs. Um, so it's like Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> The uh, acquisition of those two territories by Germany on the border uh, with France is going to be a sticking point. When you look at cartoons, especially from Punch magazine, yep. published at the time when that war was coming to an end, there is an overt, not even a subtle acknowledgement, but an overt acknowledgement by this newspaper, which is reflective of public opinion, that France will one day get them back. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a fait accompli that the war will resume again for these territories. 
it's always a, a, a it's always a question mark for Germany how long until France retakes them, and then it's also an exclamation point for France, which is just like a reminder that they lost a war, and it wasn't just like a lost war, but they were soundly beaten by this new nation in Europe, and that sort of goes to where you talk about the tension between France and Germany, I sort of tend to expand a little and talk about the tension between the old world and the new world. Yep. You have the old powers of Russia, France, and Great Britain, and now they're all of a sudden looking around and say, what's this United States? What's this Japan? What's this Germany? What's this Italy? Why are we now having to compete with these other new nations? We've been around for 500, 600, 700 years, and we've had the, you know, the rule. Since Portugal and um, Spain had been pushed off the sort of the podium mm. these were the nations that were in charge but now there's all of a sudden competition competition for market <coughs> in terms of the economy competition for africa in the scramble for africa competition for parts of china and it's coming from places where there was previously no threat and so this tension for me is what underlies the whole world war it's a global tension between old powers and new powers yeah and and this is sort of where britain finds itself on the world stage because britain is the major power at the time and a newly formed and newly unified germany under bismarck looks around the world and goes well where every bit as important as britain is Mm. where is our empire well where are we going to find our empire and your answer comes at the congress of berlin um, and it's Bismarck's sort of the way I would describe it is Bismarck's land grab um, <laughs> of the Congress of Berlin, which was let's let's settle everything down, let's let's unify everything and calm the Balkans by basically giving them to us. Can we have the Balkans, please? And it's sort of again, it's the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans are falling apart. You know, they're still pretending there's an empire there, but. There's not really an empire there, and you've got all these small states in the Balkans, which it's a good thing after World War One that was resolved, and they yeah. never they never become an issue again. The Balkan states are just calm after after Idyllic. World War. Yeah, it's it's beautiful, tranquil part of the world without war or ethnic cleansing to ever be found. <laughs> Obviously, that's a lie. But the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire because they don't really fall per se. It just slowly fractures and and fractures a little bit more and fractures a little bit more. And there are two powers that are looking at the Balkans quite keenly. The first is Germany, who sees this is a huge potential. The other is Russia, who are looking at the Balkans and, first of all, going Slavic people. Well, traditionally... You know, this is an argument you may have heard in World War II that comes up a bit of, well, traditionally they're ours. Well, for the Russians, it's traditionally the Slavic people. Well, they're sort of like Russians. Yeah, we're Slavs, they're Slavs. We're Slavs, you know, me Slav, so Slav. Um, Let's bring us all under the same tent and let's protect it. Now, the other thing that Russia's thinking about, and you alluded to, economics, is they're thinking about access to the ports and getting themselves out through the ports at the, the Black Sea. And so Russia doesn't want Germany to control, a new Germany to control this. Germany obviously doesn't want Russia to have access to economic benefits that they could take for themselves. Um, So you've got two powers eyeing off the falling parts of the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, Britain is keeping an eye on everything and going, we can't let Germany get too big because we don't want them to challenge us for resources. We don't want them to have the resources to suddenly become a threat in Asia, as you put it forward, in Africa as part of the land grab over there. So the Congress of Berlin has a massive part to play in all of this because of the geopolitical situation that surrounds it for this old and new world powers, as you put it before. Yeah, in the Congress of Berlin, I think it's Russia who first gets engaged with what now needs to happen in Europe because they're the ones who probably miss out the most on what they're expecting to get out of that. And Germany gains to the surprise of everyone. And then underlying all of that is that uh, Great Britain is propping up the Ottoman Empire with loans because they need access to India via the Mediterranean. Uh, Russia needs their... um, their cold water ports in the Black Sea. Um, And after the issues that have gone on with the Crimean War, there's no guarantee that um, Russia, Germany, France will actually be on the same page. Britain is isolationist at this point. They want nothing to do with uh, Europe because they see it's just a quagmire and a schmaltz. They've got their empire. They've got one quarter of the world's 
um, population and land under their rule, why do they need Europe? And more importantly, they've got the wealth that comes with yeah. it, and that's the bigger issue. They're a self-sustaining economy there where the <laughs> raw materials go back to Great Britain and the industrial output in Great Britain goes back to these territories, so they don't actually need any of these markets. The same can be said of France because they've got quite a large empire as well at the same time. But the lack of industrialization that's come uh, in Russia versus the newly and competitive Germany that's emerged, all of a sudden Russia realizes its need is greater than sort of uh, piddling little territories here and there. They need to be able to sustain a buffer between themselves and this new Germany. And just going back to the unification on one point, the militarization of them is really underpinned by the German version of enlightenment that occurs and the philosophers that come out of there say there is no more important relationship an individual can have between individual and state. Mm. You exist to protect the state, to contribute to the state, and the state exists to protect and contribute to you. Your family is second, your children are second, your wife or your husband is second. You and the state is the most important relationship there. And you have those German um, philosophers who really shape the ideas that Bismarck then brings to this relationship. And so there's no question that you have an obligation to the German state, whether it be in military or in industrial, you will be a German, and that's because you're German. There's no questions there, which is different to the types of nationalism you see in France, which is much more sort of liberated, but they're driven by revenge against Germany. And the nationalism that exists in Russia is this idea of pan-Slavism and their nationalism transcends borders. And the German, um, sorry, the Great Britain, Great British nationalism sort of doesn't it's just superiority. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's not a nationalism per se. It's aren't we fantastic as the yeah. British nationalism? But it's this time where you start seeing that fatherland, motherland mm. narrative starts playing up a lot more than it had in the past with real meaning. Yeah, not this idea of oh look the fatherland or the motherland being this this all encompassing general concept. Now it is a genuine, your passion should be for the fatherland. Mm. Your passion should be for the motherland. You start seeing, you know, Britain starts with Britannia and starts with those sorts mm. of things. You know, with with all of the other nations, you start seeing representations and manifestations of the country as personification, this idea of it is a living, breathing entity that you are dedicated to. And that as part of empire building and as part of nationalism, it sort of syncs up quite nicely at this point in time mm. with this militaristic idea. And, and let's not kid ourselves. At this point in time, you've had a whole pile of conflicts, and we've sort of mentioned the Crimean War, we've mentioned things, we've, we've mentioned the Franco-Prussians, we've mentioned all these sorts of things in passing. This is a period of time when nations believe that war is justifiable and good in many cases. And they believe that war is something that should be aspired to because it gives a nation its confidence. It gives a nation purpose. It's what a man does. It's what a nation does. They do war. But what the issue, not really an issue, the saving grace is that you've got Bismarck at the end of the day and he realises that and and he's and it's the title you gave him earlier, which is like he's a hero of the time. Without him, there could have been problems, and it's proven by the fact that when he's gone, the problems emerge. He's the one who realizes after our sailor rain, our you know, let's let's put a pause on all these wars. And what happens is he really goes to work on this concert of Europe, and his all his whole effort is to a avoid a massive war and B, avoid Russia and France linking up as allies, because if they do, not only is Germany threatened, but it's likely war will be inevitable from that. And this is where realpolitics from Bismarck is really fundamental to understanding the era. And as you've just brought up the idea of Germany, of of France and and Russia linking up, let's get into the, the secondary plan that Germany had in mind, in case they couldn't prevent this. Because it's at this point in time that the German military comes up with their strategy. Fight. It's as you get towards the turn of the century, as you start getting towards... The, that is when the Schlieffelin plan comes into into general being and this, mm. con, 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 this general concept becomes part of it. Now, obviously, Bismarck is in favour of avoiding war at this point because, again, the other thing to think about is, while well, war is the blooding of a nation, it also depletes your resources and depletes your nation. manpower and can be, your, can be your ending. And if war doesn't particularly go well... And again, for Germany, yes, they, they've got a strong tradition with the Prussians and those sorts of things. 
but so does France at this point in time. And again, in a modern context, France is always looked at as a bit of a laughing stock in terms of military by what happens in World War II and the quick capitulation. Mm. And everyone goes, oh, the French, oh, the French. But if you go back and look through the history of France as a military power, they're actually quite strong. Mm. The French have a very good military history. The British bring up what happens with Napoleon, but that takes a long time for that to happen. And you know, the, you know, Vienna is really the, the finalising of sort of that. But before that, the French had been one of the dominant military powers in the world. So French military strength is still in everyone's mind. Um, if you're Germany, you're not looking at this idea of France being weak. You're looking at them as a strong military power yeah. on your border, and you are a fledgling nation trying to make sure that you can establish yourself. You don't want war. You do not want that. Russia on the other side, same thing. You don't necessarily want... Now, Russia has a few issues that, that sort of... A few wars that don't necessarily go the way they need them to be going, you know, I, I think... The, Japan, for example, mm. um, and, and the reputation that happens with Russia, and we'll look at that as a cause in a minute. But you still don't want to take on the Russians. So if you're Germany, you're looking at this situation and going, we've got a really hostile power that could take us out on one side and a hostile power that could take us out on the other side. We need to come up with a way to stop this. Mm. Schlieflin, Count von Schlieflin, is the guy who comes up with the idea. And the plan, as, again, if you're been a high school student at any point in the last 30 years, you know what the Schlieffelin plan is. But the Schlieffelin plan is basically let's knock the French out as fast as humanly possible. Six weeks. Six weeks because the idea was that Russian mobilisation would take six to eight. So you knock the French out within six weeks, you can move your troops back over and be ready to defend yourself against the Russians because you don't want to fight a war on two, fr- on two fronts. That is suicide. So the concept of the Schlieffelin plan is, first of all, we mentioned the territories of Alsace-Lorraine, the French are going to think that's where they're going Mm. because the French will want those back, so the French will go, well, they're going to defend them. That's what Plan 17, which is the French French plan, plan is to first recapture those and then from there go to Berlin. Yeah, for for anyone who questions the idea of did the French have any purpose beyond revenge, the answer is Plan 17, which was, no, it was revenge. We'll take those back first, then then we'll think about it. Schlieffelin looks at the situation militarily and goes, we need to get into France as fast as humanly possible. We need to be where the French army isn't. The answer is Belgium. Now, we'll come back to the politic of Belgium as the solution, but the general concept is overwhelm the side where the French aren't, sweep into into France, encircle Paris, knock the French out of the war. Once the French are out, you can send troops back over to the other side. The Russians won't be mobilised yet. And by the time the Russians are mobilised, you're ready and your troops are battle-hardened and the war is going to be yours. That's the concept, at least. And Russian supply lines will take a while, so all you have to do is win the initial battles. And you can probably force the Russians to sue for peace. Now, there are a few stumbling blocks to this. The first of them is Russia. Now, they're not aware at the time that Russia, rather than taking six weeks to mobilise, has been modernising a little bit. You know, they've been building a giant railway, for example, maybe one that goes across, let's say, Siberia, mm-hmm. and allows them to mobilise significantly faster. Secondly, the Russians have already thought about this idea of what are we going to do about Germany, and the answer is we won't take six weeks to mobilise. We'll be ready beforehand. So the Russians are also, and we talked about this before, the foreign minister for the Russians is very keen on war, ultra keen on war. So it's not going to take much for him to get involved. The French, well, to be honest, they're a little bit hapless at this point. (laughs) Their setup doesn't actually prevent the Schlieffelin plan whatsoever. What does, however, impact the Schlieffelin plan is that he dies. (laughs) Bit of a problem. And the guy who comes up with the idea and is the one guy in German high command who is really keen on his own idea dies. Now, before we started recording, you of course raised my favourite point, which is that who is the person who dismantles the plan, and who is the person who then further dismantles the plan? So, um, the general from the German army who's in charge of executing Schlieffen 
in 1914 is uh, von Moltke. And he has already weakened the right arm, sometimes called the hammer, sometimes yep. called the right wing, whatever. Um, that's the one that will encircle Paris, go through Belgium, come around Paris, encircle them, pincer movement, Paris is defeated, now we all trot off to Russia. He's weakened that arm after his uncle some 10 years before already weakened it before. So these plans, the Schlieffen plan was written and then continually updated based on the situation on the ground. One of those updatings was that uh, France was building more fortresses along the shared border where Alsace Lorraine were. And so the old, the elder uh, von Molke, he figures, well, we're going to need more troops there. Otherwise, they're going to be able to penetrate right up to Berlin before we even get to Paris. Otherwise, we're going to... And if that happens, we're going to be defeated. So he shifts people from the right arm, which is the worst decision you can make with Schlieffen, down to the south. And then uh, von Molke, who's in 1914, he loses his nerve and he's supposed to keep as many troops there But as the French make significant gains down in the south, in the shared border, on the shared border, he loses his nerve and starts withdrawing them from both the right and the second right wings and sending them south to stop the the French advance. Now there's no chance of getting through. That combined with Belgian resistance to the actual invasion, which slows them down by hours, which is crucial for this whole plan. Uh, it just means that you just essentially get the stalemate on the Western Front. Yeah, and I mean the, the thing the thing about the Schlieffen plan when you when you look at the concept of the plan is that if you don't lose your nerve and if you keep that side strong and charge towards Paris, the French have a decision to make. Do you keep pushing in to Germany or do you retreat and defend Paris? And the point was that the French army would feel the need to turn around and go and defend. But even by the time they got back, Paris would still be defeated. So yeah. it, was, it was if he had been able to hold his nerve, it should have been a lose-lose situation for France. Yep, you've got to make a call. There has to be a decision made. And the idea would be that the Germans would be so strong that they could then turn around, head All back to back. Germany, and be able to take the French lines out from behind as they went. And minimise it. So the plan itself, the military plan they have in backup in case this diplomacy idea fails, is a sound principle but just lacks people with the will to carry them out. Now the other thing that this then leads us into is the good old stock standard alliance system. Hmm. So when I teach World War I, the way that I teach it is to get through to students who may not necessarily be able to understand the alliance system. I treat the alliance system very much like a schoolyard fight. And it's a couple of smaller kids, like kids, so I say, like year seven kids. And they they want to fight. It's like, I'm going to fight you. Yeah, I'm going to fight you too. I'm going to get my big brother. And they go back to their big brother and go, can you come fight this kid for me? And the other big brother comes. They Then two big brothers are dragged into the situation. And this really small fight that probably could have been resolved escalates with bigger brothers. Then they're dragging cousins. Then they're dragging other family members. And literally in the case of Europe, because they're all related to each other. (laughs) And the next thing you know, you've got all of these people coming in ready to fight now. And they've kind of got it. Everyone's now in a situation where fighting has to happen. Now, the alliance system itself is fascinating to me, and this is where we're going to start getting into the general geopolitical, insofar as the amount of influence, and from a modern perspective it's hard to understand, that Austria-Hungary has on this whole situation. Austria-Hungary are almost the fulcrum that sort of drags everybody into this equation. And it starts with their alliance with Germany. And they have a very sound, you know, traditional alliance with Germany. And we'll get into the geopolitical reasons why, and in particular, Franz Joseph, who's quite an interesting <laughs> character. <coughs> and, and we'll look at why they get along so well. But Austria-Hungary, you know, the last vestiges of, of the old sort of Hungarian empire and the old, old, old world. We're talking about old world powers and new world powers. Austria-Hungary is kind of a very old world power, Mm. um, clinging to the last vestiges. Um, And Austria-Hungary is able to draw in Germany as part of this sphere of influence. Um, And on the other side, Russia, you know, the enemy of my enemy. So France and Russia are looking at each other, and this is what Germany feared. France and Russia are looking at each other going, well, you don't like Germany. We, We don't like Germany. How about we don't like Germany together? Why don't we just do that? So you start this alliance system 
just based on who do you hate, well, I hate them too, let's be friends. And it's a really, it's a haphazard sort of system. It's, it's, it's based in sound general theory, but it's also a haphazard. Like, the idea that Italy ends up on both sides of it, is, for me, is, is, is priceless. Because Italy finds themselves on all sides of the alliance structure. And they're friends with everybody. Um, which is great, because when the war is declared, Italy go, we're in. No, we're not. No. And run away at 100 mile an hour. So what you'll also notice in my general quick, probably poor description of the alliance system at the start, there's no Britain yet. <laughs> and this goes back to your point before about Britain is very isolationist at this point when it comes to Europe. What do they have to gain from being part of this European mess? They have no interest in the Balkans. They have no interest in anything there. So... The irony for me is that Britain gets brought in by Kaiser Wilhelm II's ineptitude as a leader. Yeah. So you've got to go back to his ascension. His father's a reasonable monarch, works quite well with Bismarck. Um, there's the, um, the, the Reichstag. Yeah. It's, it's just a nominal democracy. Whatever Bismarck wants, Wilhelm will sign off on. Yeah. He dies. And then his Enfant Terrible uh, son... <laughs> Ascent, and he brings with him sort of what you imagine of a third generation. We often hear about um, you know, third generations being the worst of a generation. The first one is the hard-working ones; they make their name. The second one keeps the ship steady, but the third one is has not had the exposure to that hard work. Yeah. This is what Wilhelm II's big problem is. He was born with a crippled arm when he was yanked out at birth. He's always been looked down on as, as, as sort of unworthy of his position and he's caught up in the nationalist wave that has emerged out of the hard work of his grandfather and father. And so once he takes over, clearly there's, a, there's, a, there's an impasse between him and uh, Bismarck. Bismarck wants softly, softly, let's diplomatically resolve these problems and get something out of it every single time. That's real politics. Uh, Wilhelm is so much different. He says, Germany first every single time, which sort of reminds me of someone who's in charge right now. Don't know. And I think, just to sort of go aside on that, I think the comparisons between, say, Trump and Hitler are unfair. I think Trump and Wilhelm, Wilhelm. II are actually far more accurate mm. based on sort of the general interpretation of him, but that's a different podcast altogether. Um Bismarck is dismissed by Wilhelm. He's essentially fired, but he's allowed to take himself off to the sunset. And some of his last remarks to his wife and his advisors when he's fired is that, mark my words, 20 years from now we'll be at war. And nearly to the day they're at war. They're very good. The generals on that point were very good at predictions. Again, I've I've raised in a previous podcast my favourite quote post-Versailles, which is, this is not a peace, this is an armistice for 20 years. Almost bang bang on. They're very good at predicting. And so with Wilhelm dismissing Bismarck, that is the person holding the concert of Europe together. He's the person whose whole life goal is to keep France and Russia from forming an alliance, and they haven't until Bismarck's gone. And he's also the person who's able to play St. Britain without dragging them into European conflicts. With him gone... The Kaiser thinks, well, now's the time to build the German Empire at the expense of other people. We have the first and second Moroccan crises, Mm -hmm. which happened in the early 1900s. The first one is where uh, France is involved in Morocco. Germany essentially doesn't like that and tries to needle them out. They expect that by going to an international conference, everyone will back Germany because no one likes France. What actually happens as a result of that is that the rest of the world, except the Austro-Hungarians, back France's right to rule Morocco, and all of a sudden, France is in an agreement with Great Britain. And Great Britain sees this and then the second Moroccan crisis as a bit of an issue, combined with the fact that Germany supported the Boers in the Boer War, which was the uh, war in South Africa against the British and the sort of Dutch inhabitants who were there first. Germany's starting to encroach on this uh, Great Britain and Great British Empire, and they're starting to think, well, hold on a sec. You are happy to let us alone, live and let live. But now, all of a sudden, you're starting to annoy us, and if you're going to annoy us, we're going to need an ally. So why don't we just resolve our differences with France, which is the least, the, like, the least expected outcome of all of this, that Britain and France will get on the same page. 
but they can't turn to Germany, even though there's a chance that Germany and Britain could have allied at various points. And Wilhelm at one point really wants that to happen because he's using the fact that, you know, he's royal family. Mm. They're know. all cousins. I they're mean, Tsar Nicholas, Wilhelm II and King George, yep. they're all cousins. There are several great photos of them at, at Queen Victoria's birthday, Queen for example, Victoria. and there's a couple of other great family photos where pretty much everyone involved in this conflict is in the photo. Yeah. And if it hadn't been Wilhelm's poor leadership, Britain wouldn't have been driven to France and then wouldn't have been driven to Russia to create the Triple Entente. And furthermore, it's the way that Kaiser Wilhelm decides to approach the Ottomans that really puts Britain on high alert. And the overtures that he makes to the Ottomans is... Because both sides are trying to woo the Ottomans at this point in time to... One, to shore up. The British are trying to shore up a bit of a corridor, and they're trying to shore up up their Indian corridor. And, look, the British just wanted to make sure their trade routes were fine. That's that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not even about Russian access at this point in time. It's about British access. Mm. And can the British still get their resources through? So they're trying to woo... uh, They're trying to woo what's left of the Ottomans. Um, The Germans decide to really make a statement... And it comes back to something that, again, if you've done any form of high school history on World War One, the dreadnoughts, the race of the dreadnoughts between Germany yeah, and Britain race. and the arms race and the, the fact that you build a dreadnought, we'll build two, we'll, we'll build two, we'll, we'll build two. Kaiser Wilhelm turns up to go and talk to the Ottomans and appears. And when he, when he appears, he has a large proportion of the fleet off the coast and basically like keeps on pointing out to the battleships off to the coast and going, look, look out there, there are our guns. And it is deliberately, it's not just to intimidate the Ottomans. It's making a statement to the British as well. This is going to be ours. We are here to protect the Ottomans. You want this area, you're going to have to come through us for it. And, again, it's that recklessness of Kaiser Wilhelm, Mm. who really does want war. He's very keen on the idea of war. And, again, it's this nation-building concept we come back to, the idea of it's a maker of nations. And it's, for him, third generation, proving character. And it's kind of interesting when you look at the the leaders at this point in time as well. If you think about Nicholas II, for example, he come through, you know, again, his his father, grandfather, Mm. again, sort of a third generation in in that situation there. You've got, in Britain, you know, George, who's finally got control of the country because his mother has finally died. <laughs> finally died after a long mm. period of time where it looked like she'd just be around forever. Um, and so he's also trying to sort of establish himself and prove himself on a world stage, given that the rest of the world has not known another British ruler in a really long time. There's no one alive. Who exactly. No one alive best. really recognises anyone other than Victoria. So you've got that situation playing out. Then in Austria-Hungary, you've got this really interesting situation of a man who was not liked by anybody within the royal family in Franz Ferdinand, the Archduke, and Franz Joseph, who is this militaristic old dog, so to speak, Mm. who wants to preserve this Austro-Hungarian empire at all costs and sees Wilhelm as like a a kindred spirit in that regard. Yeah, an old throwback. Yes, and he sees him, and I think he's far happier with Wilhelm II and looking at him and going, we're on the same line here, I like this. Whereas the standout for me in all of these people is Franz Ferdinand, who is far more moderate than the rest Mm -hmm. of them. He's far more progressive. Mm. Um, He's the sort of... Which is why he wasn't liked by anybody. Yeah, he he was for... Serbian autonomy, at the very least, probably independence had he come to power. Yeah, he was probably happy to placate the Hungarian faction of his empire and allow them to break away as well. He he didn't have dreams of empire. I think he had dreams of progress. And the only sort of people you could match him with, and this, and I think this is probably a fair comparison, is. President Theodore Roosevelt, who's on the other side of the world. This is the generation of the progressive politicians coming out of Western democracies. You have Lloyd George as well, um, who will take over. Yes, he won't do a great job at Versailles, but he will do a great job of reforming Great Britain. And so all these progressives in the pre-World War I era, had they managed to establish and maintain control, or not get killed, there probably would have been a very good chance that 
there would have been a great century of uh, prosperity coming forward. Yeah, and I mean, in America, you see that later on with with a Wilson as well, who then gets mm. stymied by his own hard, hard, very conservative, get out of this situation mentality. But Wilson's another one of those yeah. who comes along at that point in time. So you've got this alliance system that's starting to be structured with a lot of people who are trying to prove a hell of a lot. So it's always referred to as this powder keg, mm. and, and it's the, it is the easiest description because it's also accurate. World War I is not a rapid bang, regardless of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand being the spark that lights it. This is a powder keg that takes off, as we've already sort of shown, almost 100 years beforehand at, at Vienna is the starting, very starting machinations. Yeah, people have been pouring that gunpowder in, but at the same time, when that assassination occurs, and even up until the ultimatum, no one thinks a war is going to happen. There's already been mm. two wars in the Balkans amongst the people in the Balkans that haven't started and that have been solved di- diplomatically. One in 1912, one in 1913. So why is 1914 going to be So let's different? go through that, because this is where we do have views that are somewhat similar, but also there is a, there is a difference. And it's in terms of where you ascribe blame for the war and how you feel the war came to be. So looking at the, the run-in to what happens in 1914, you know, the guns of 1914 and all those <laughs> sorts of things, looking at the run-in to 1914, you've had, as you said, the Balkans have already gone twice, mm. and everyone sort of expects the Balkans are going to keep doing this. There is an expectation that this has not been resolved but there's also an expectation, this is the Balkans. Yeah, there's the expectation that the mature nations will step up, and that's what happens every time in 1912, 1913. Great Britain proposes a diplomatic solution, and the first person to agree is Germany. Yep. And then 1913, Great Britain proposes a diplomatic solution, Germany's the first one to agree to it. 1914 yeah. comes around, Great Britain proposes, proposes a solution, and Germany's the first one to say no. no. And this is where you get a change. Now, Britain is trying desperately to not go to war, and I don't even think it was about not being at war. Again, I go back to Britain and their their economic policy. The British have no need to be at war. They're rich. They've got plenty of resources. They've got plenty of wealth. They don't want war because they know that war costs you manpower, war costs you resources, war is going to drain all of this stuff that Britain is building. Hmm. They don't really want to do that. And especially not over something like the Balkans, which has absolutely no benefit to them outside of a trade route. So for me, with the saying, this is the first, and or not the first, but it's the last time the Liberals will ever be in power by themselves in Great Britain. Made up of that cabinet is one agitator... Winston Churchill is like, we must go to war with Germany, do it now before they're a bigger threat and they can beat us later. But the rest of them, you've got Lloyd George on there uh, and you've got uh, Sir Edward Grey on there and all these people who are like, no, diplomacy, the Mm. deft hand, this will solve it. And the reason they want to go on the Balkans, because if they took their eye on the Balkans, they've got to take their eye off Ireland. Yep. And if they lose Ireland, then there's a big problem. And that's that is, the biggest concern all the way through July for them as well. Well, to be fair, it's kind of the biggest concern for Britain through most of the war. Even while the Western Front is happening, yep. they're terrified about what's happening in Ireland. And rightly so, because it is on their doorstep. You know, much like the, the discussion that is often had with Australian war, when people talk about World War One versus World War Two, And the reason why World War Two holds far more real-world significance than a Gallipoli is because World War II is actually on our doorstep. Yeah. You know, there is, a, there is a chance. You know, Japan is just to the north. We are actually being advanced upon. Whereas with World War I, we are fighting in a foreign country. We are fighting on the other side of the world. That is more for us. You know, again, World War II has a very real connotation of if you lose this, you're in trouble. Mm. For Britain, well, yes, it's in Europe. Remember, they're in Ireland. They're isolated. Mm. Their biggest problem is Ireland, who are... Neutral, but not really. They're sort of talking to the Germans. They're getting assistance. They're, getting they're offering, the yeah, they're getting weapons from the Germans. They're offering assistance for the Germans yeah, at money times from here. America as well. Exactly. The, the Irish are a bigger problem for for Britain at this point in time than anything happening in the Balkans. So, for Britain, they look at the situation and they don't want to be there mm. at this point in time. They're trying really hard not to. Having said that, 
they also have to keep weaponising because they see Germany weaponising. Well, they've got their policy, which is that their navy yep. will be the size of number two and three of the world. So they'll yes. be number one, and if they can buy number two and three navy, they still need a bigger navy, which is a <clears throat> a reasonable policy until someone decides to race you, yep. and then all of a sudden you have a big problem. Yeah, and then the problem was that Germany decided to race. Yep. Um, and Germany start again. And, and the thing that, even though it's a general militaristic system, the thing that always is the symbol of it is the dreadnoughts. Yep. And it's the Germany starts building dreadnoughts, Britain starts building, and there's this race. And everyone that they build, they want to build too. So they want to build too. And mm. it just becomes an escalation. And it's one of those things where if you build all these weapons, eventually... You're going to have to use them. You, you, you've got to use them at some point. So like, it goes back to the uh, Manhattan Project with dropping the A-bomb on Japan. The, no, I, want, I don't want to say revisionist, but the non-orthodox story is that a lot of the decision for Truman was that how am I going to sell mm. this multi-million dollar program to the people if we don't use it? Yep. And what if it fails? So I've got to test this bomb out. And so that's part of the driver that um, sort of pushes him to drop the bomb. <laughs> Same thing with um, Germany. We've got this Navy. Now what are we going to yeah, do? Yeah, what are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to have to use it. Yeah, we've got to use it. We've just had everyone build it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... For Britain, they've got into this race with Germany they, that I don't think anyone will argue they intended to get into. They don't don't think they intended to get into a race with Germany. They found themselves in one and weren't going to be outspent. Whereas Germany wanted that. Yes. Race. Now, this is where we have a bit of a discussion about hmm. the causes of the war. Because blame, and again, blame becomes a big issue in 1918 and 1919 when it comes time to sign a little bit of a treaty called <laughs> Versailles. And, and again, officially... Officially, with the treaty, the blame rests on 100% with Germany. They did um, all. Yeah, they did everything, war guilt clause, all of those sorts of fun little bits and pieces. That now, we have differing views on, on who wants war, who doesn't want war, and, and who really is the catalyst. I put a hell of a lot of blame on, on two nations. I put a lot of blame on to Austria-Hungary. And I think that Austria-Hungary act in a somewhat reckless manner at times. And again, this is Franz Joseph and and his foreign minister, I think it was Berthold, um, having this just, we really want war. We're really keen for war because they're trying to, again, part of this is restore the glory of Austria-Hungary. Um, the other nation is Russia, um, who has a hell of a lot of a role in this. I will put forward the theory, and I'll, I'll put my theory forward now before Thomas knocks it down and, 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 <laughs> and proves against it. But Austria-Hungary, at the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, now a lot of people go, well, they, they killed the Archduke. Of course Austria-Hungary is going to want war. Except, as we've sort of mentioned before, nobody liked Franz Ferdinand, especially his uncle. He did not have any time for him. He thought he was far too moderate. He thought he was weak. He thought there was no chance that he was going to make a good leader. Um, Franz Ferdinand, the issue is that he makes a visit, and if you go back through it, he makes a visit on the wrong day. Yes. Realistically. He visits on the day that celebrates this idea of Pan-Slavic nationalism and Serbian nationalism in particular. Um, probably not the right day to turn up. Um, if, if you're honest, if you were if you're planning a tour, you'd probably go. Let's pick another day. It's it's almost like um, if we go back to World War Two um, on the eve of it, because tensions are yeah. rising with Japan. Japan just making it, the, the leader of Japan, the Emperor uh, Hirohito, rocking up on Australia Day. Yeah, exactly. That sort of thing. Going hi, we're Japan, and we'd like to sort of have yeah. a bit of a say in how you're governed. No, not going to work. So. Franz Ferdinand turns up in Sarajevo. Obviously, that doesn't go to plan. They more ways you know, than one. They throw they throw the grenade at him. That doesn't Bronco. work. Um, the driver on the way out gets lost. Turns down a street. Bumps into Princip, who shoots him and his wife. And you're thinking, well, instantly, instantly, this happens. Well, twenty eighth of June is the assassination. Yeah. And it's called the July Crisis for a reason. Yeah, because on the 23rd of July, Austria-Hungary presents Serbia the ultimatum. Now, it's an ultimatum that, in my mind, and again, if you go through and have a look at the ultimatum, it is designed to be all or nothing. You must agree to all points of this ultimatum or else. <clears throat> now, Or else war. Everyone knows what yeah. it is. Now, Serbia is never going to agree to every single point in this. They agree to all bar one. 
Yeah, the interesting part is that it's designed to be rejected <laughs> outright, but they actually send this this uh, telegram that the Kaiser, when he realises what the reply is, the Kaiser worries that the the war's not going to happen. Yes. Because they agree to everything except the one clause, which is that the Austrian uh, military or police will come in and do the investigation, overruling the constitution of Serbia, which is that they have their own police force to investigate things. And this is, this is part of where I think it all comes in, is that... Austria phrased it in such a way that they know that Serbia is going to say no. Serbia phrases their response in a way that makes it look like they've said yes. it's all de-escalated and they've actually said yes to everything. And so Germany looks at that and goes, oh, no. it's not going to happen. right? Now, there are two schools of thought here. Does Germany look at it and go, it's not going to happen, and go, oh, God, we really wanted that to happen? Or does Germany look at it and go, good, we've got some more time to prepare? My view on it is that Germany looks at the ultimatum, looks at the response and goes, we've got a little bit more time. And I'll come back to why I think that that was more the German thought process in a minute. Because the other thing that happens at this point in time, and the other country I've given the blame to is Russia. Because... The 25th of July is when Serbia rejects the ultimatum. And they reject it in a nice way, but they reject it. The 25th of July is also the day that Russia begins what they don't call mobilisation. Secret mobilisation. It's sort of a pre-mobilisation, war preparedness, readiness, general thing. They don't phrase it as mobilisation. It's pre-mobilisation preparedness, basically. The Russian army is mobilising. That's actually what they're doing. They're not phrasing it as mobilisation, but they're ready. So Russia, before Serbia has even said no, Russia is ready. And they are ready to start moving their troops into position and they are ready to go to war. So Russia actually starts, I think, the problem that Germany would face because Germany starts looking, oh, hang on a minute, they're they're moving. And Austria-Hungary looks at it and goes, Russia's, okay, we've got a problem now. The other thing, of course, that happens in this period of time is the blank check. So let's discuss the idea of the blank check because we have differing yeah, opinions on the blank where we check. Most starkly to film. I am of the opinion that Germany gives the blank check not so much for instant conflict. I am of the opinion that Germany gives the blank check as reassurance to Austria that down the line we have your back. Not instantly use this blank check to go to war. My theory behind this is that Germany understands that Austria-Hungary is not ready for war. The farmers are out harvesting, right, which is also predominantly the Austro-Hungarian army. Bit of a problem. So Austria is marching towards a war that they currently have no troops for. This is a problem. And Kaiser Wilhelm would have known that they had no troops ready at this point in time. He would have been aware. You know, they would have been in very close contact. The military would have known what the Austro-Hungarian military situation was because part of preparedness is understanding your allies. So you would suspect that they knew that Austria wasn't ready for war yet. If Austria is not ready for war, that places extra burden on the German army. You know, they're already going to have to be carrying the bulk of this because it's the Austrian army and they're not as strong. So Germany's already carrying a large burden. Germany also has their military plan, as we know, which is Schlieflin, which is already being weakened and they're moving troops around and it's sort of a bit of a hodgepodge now and it's not this organised, structured thing they have. So Germany can't draw more troops from this at the moment because it's already being moved around. My theory is that Germany desperately wanted war. But Germany were about six months away from really, really needing war to happen. They were happy to go with it once it went. But they really would have preferred if they could have cooled this situation a little bit more and then in six months' time gone again. Um, Because Austria-Hungary marches them into a conflict, and I said it's the big brother, little brother thing. No, little Austria-Hungary, and I use the word quite incorrectly because they are an empire, failing, but they are an empire, goes up to little Serbia, who is little, and goes, we're going to beat you up. And then Serbia threatens to get their big brother, Russia. Austria-Hungary goes and talks to their big brother, Germany, and goes, look, down the line, if we need help, you've got our back, right? And Germany goes, yeah, sure, whenever. And then Austria-Hungary goes, well, that's great, because, like, now. And Germany's not quite ready for that. And I think... 
a large reason, the other reason why they're not quite ready for that is we've mentioned the Schlieffelin plan and the speed of which you need to invade France. The other thing there is that Britain has promised to defend Belgian neutrality. The Schlieffelin plan involves going through Belgium. The last thing you want to do if you're Germany is engage Britain as well. You've already got to worry about France. You've already got to worry about Russia. We've said the Kaiser had some form of idea that there was still an ability to form this alliance with Britain or at least get Britain to say we'll stay out of it. So you would assume the Kaiser Wilhelm II would have much preferred six more months to talk to, talk to Britain and go, what is it going to take for you to stay the hell out of this? What is it going to take for you to not get involved in this situation? Instead, we're dragged, kicking and screaming, and everyone is dragged in. France mobilises, Germany mobilises, Germany declares war on Russia, Germany declares war on France. The second they do that, they've got to roll into Belgium. The second they roll into Belgium, Britain's in. So you've gone from this minor squabble and the, and the Balkans, and we've talked about the idea of the Balkans blowing up several times and everyone going, oh, yeah, it's the Balkans, that will be fine. What is different this time is that Austria-Hungary drags everybody into the middle of it and Russia drags their side into it by mobilising ahead of time and basically forcing the hand of Germany to go in, I think, six months before they were ready. That's my view on it. Your take. So when I look at the blank sheet, it sort of goes back to the question that I ask in regards to who foots all the blame because I put 90% of the blame on Germany. And so the question I start with is, who did something different to all the times that came before? Germany's the one who does something different. They reject the diplomatic solution. They send this secret uh, blank check to Austria-Hungary, which is supposed to give them a backbone to actually do something this time. So in the previous times, Austria-Hungary has never been able to make ground or um, advances into the Balkans because they've been afraid of pretty much anything. A uh, shiny object, that's scary because they're so uh, tenuously held together that they're, the, li- the stiffest wind will knock them over. That stiff wind being the steamroller from Russia. So they're afraid of not... Uh, the, sorry, the Germans are afraid that the, the Austro-Hungarians just won't act enough So they give them the blank check to encourage them to come down hard on Serbia. And it goes back to some of the rhetoric that was also coming out of Wilhelm at the time. He sends this message out publicly that an attack on one monarchy is an attack on all monarchies. And he hopes that this um, attack on Serbia has enough grounding to scare off the Russian Tsar, who's just seen an attempted revolution and crushed it and bring, brought in the Duma and whatnot, um, that this will win the sympathies of Great Britain because they've got their own monarchy and they've always um, been hesitant to sort of declare a, you know, a stability. You know, you've just come out of Victoria and you know, questions might be asked with rising parliamentary power. Uh, and that France, who's got this history of you know chopping heads off of monarchs, will be kept out because they'll be the only person or the only group of people that don't want the war or or that want war and everyone else doesn't. And so I think the public message is, well, one, one dead monarch might as well be all dead monarchs, is a cover or the first attempt at scaring everyone off from doing anything to Austria, Hungary, because he knows they're going to come down hard, because he's given them the blank check. And he wants them to come down hard because this is their last stand. If Austria-Hungary fails now, they're going to fail at everything else they do. Next time something goes wrong with them, they're going to fall apart. So this is the chance to rebuild them. Austria-Hungary, I don't think, was prepared to do that by themselves. Uh, Franz Joseph is old, decrepit. He's not effectively ruling anymore. He knows, they know that the army is essentially backwaters compared to everyone else. He knows that he's number one ally. Sorry, the Kaiser knows that he's number one ally. Is not up to the standard of a modern power. And so this blank check is to guarantee that A, Austria-Hungary does something very significant and B, that it does push them into a war which will drag Germany into a war, which is the war they've been wanting for a long time. Then comes fact, then is factored in 
the fact that they've got to run to timetable with Schlieffen and that this blank check has been provided so that it gives them the earliest possible advance, that as soon as Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia, that's the sign that German mobilisation needs to begin because they've got to get, you know, they've for the previous 10 years, they've been doing the preparations for Schlieffen. The train stations had been elongated so that more troops could be landed on the regular train timetable. The trains are already being shipped to uh, to Berlin, to Dusseldorf, to Nuremberg to load up the troops on the second they got it. If there's no blank check, there's no guarantee Serbia does anything, which means there's no forewarning that we need to start mobilising early. I see the blank check as sort of the thing that is the point of no return because that's the thing that is different to what's happened every other time. Austria-Hungary has been allowed to settle its disputes in the Balkans by itself without German reassurances. Diplomacy has prevailed, but now Germany's done something different. The blame goes on to them with the blank check alongside Russia, who once they know they declare mobilization means war becomes inevitable. So I put 90% of the blame on Germany and then 10% on Russia. I think what we can both agree on is that the biggest mistake, as far as I see it, in this whole period of war remains Kaiser Wilhelm doing absolutely nothing to guarantee British neutrality and the idea of keeping Britain out of it. And I think knowing they were going through Belgium and knowing they needed to, I think the biggest weakness that anyone has in this period of time is Wilhelm does nothing to stop the British. Mm. He does nothing to placate them. He does nothing to give them some form of, again, I think if he offered them guaranteed trade routes through to be able to get their stuff through from India, to be able to keep the economic stuff flowing, he may well have been able to get them to stay out of it, or at least for a period of time. Um, if he guaranteed no German assistance to Ireland, for example, I think the British may well have listened to that as well. Um, but I think that Wilhelm ignoring the idea of violating Belgium, and I think part of it was, well, the British aren't going to go to war over Belgium. And having this mentality of they're not going to do that, I think is probably the biggest miscalculation in the entire prelude to war. I th- yeah, I... I don't know if it's the biggest miscalculation from for my perspective. It's certainly one of the bigger ones. If only because repeatedly the Kaiser sends telegrams, what will it take to guarantee British neutrality? And the British have signed these secret agreements with France yeah. and with Russia that, that the Kaiser doesn't know. Nor does the British Parliament really know. The only person who actually knows what's been signed is Edward Grey. Yeah. And so all of a sudden the French are on his doorstep saying, you remember when you signed this? And if and the clause is, if France ever goes to war with Germany, France will patrol the Mediterranean and Britain will patrol the Straits. Yep. And if, even if they're not involved in the war, they will protect French ports. So you can declare neutrality and do this. Edward Grey goes, oh, this is going to be a problem. If I take this back to Parliament, this is essentially an act of war for us. He can't guarantee and he can't give an answer to the Kaiser and his ministers of saying, what will it take to... Uh, get you to be neutral because it would mean either betraying France and then later it's about betraying uh, Belgium. Once they've decided they're not going to betray France, which is a tenuous agreement, they're definitely not going to betray Belgium, Belgium, which has a legitimate ironclad agreement there. And that's what (coughs) essentially happens. If the Kaiser had said, we're not going to go through Belgium and didn't go through Belgium, just went through Luxembourg, for example, and somehow had managed a war that way, it's pretty likely Great Britain could have just sort of stayed on the edge and said, well, this isn't a war that involves us, found some wiggle room, said, yeah, we'll patrol the ports, but they're, they're not going to be engaged in war, so if Britain... If, well, the reason for patrolling the ports becomes British um, economic interests. Yeah, economic. So they, can, they could argue with the French, we're not involved in the war, but we are going to patrol the ports simply because our economic interests are involved. Hmm. We're, we're so, going to clear neutrality. And all, they, and, all they say, and all they say to both sides is, right, you stay out of our way, we won't attack you. The second you engage in any activity off the coast which impacts our economic activity, hmm. then we get involved, which probably still would have brought them in on the French side anyway because the Germans patrolling that area, you know, it's probably only a matter of time before the U-boats or the, the, the campaign there takes place and something happens. Mm. And it's probably only a matter of time, especially if America starts looking at the situation and thinking about it later on. But again, America's engagement is primarily through Britain and, and yeah. that's, that's primarily linked in there. The other thing I think is quite interesting about this, <laughs> we haven't discussed it. We have, but we haven't. 
the impact of the fall and the breakup of the Ottoman Empire. Mm. Now, I think that the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire, and we haven't really discussed them with regards to blame. We're talking about these major powers. But I think a large proportion of blame goes on the way that the Ottoman Empire crumbled and the way that that was managed or not, not managed. as the case may be. And you could almost look at this idea of what happens in 1911 and 1913 and go on, you really could have resolved that situation a little bit better because it was taking the heat out of the situation rather than looking for a resolution as such. And I think that the way the Ottoman Empire, I think if it had just completely collapsed... As it does at the end of the war. Then we probably could have actually avoided a large proportion of what took place because I think an absolute collapse would have just seen people moving in and it wouldn't have been... It still would have been conflict, but it wouldn't have been this global thing, whereas it sort of collapses but sort of doesn't, so there's still the the general overreaching hand of the Ottomans in the area as well, plus then you've got the Russians leaning in. And I think Ottoman Empire collapse the Russians may feel a little bit more comfortable with their ports, for example, than worrying about what's happening with the Ottomans. So I think that 1911 and 1913, while it prevents a crisis and prevents a war, also then prompts what takes place in 1914 and and, and onwards because there is no complete collapse. And that is where I will come back to you on Germany and say they may get a little bit more blame than I originally ascribe because the Kaisers work with the Ottomans in sort of semi-propping them up. I think I actually think that gives him more blame than anything that happens with Austria-Hungary. Propping the Ottomans up and giving them this idea of, yeah, you're still an important power. <laughs> you're still important. And that, I think if, if, if the Ottomans aren't propped up by Germany in that way, if Russia feels a bit better about their warm water ports, or their cold water ports, if they feel a bit better about their ports in general, they can get their shipping out, mm-hmm. they're not as likely to go in over Serbia. The only reason why I think they may still have gone in is that Russia, after what had happened with their other previous conflicts, Russia really needs a military win. Yeah, that's that's something that is often undersold, I think. Russia... They've been embarrassed. Yeah, they've been beaten by Japan, which is the most embarrassing for a European power. It's the first time an Asian nation has ever actually defeated a European uh, onslaught, and they do it so... Uh, simply, it's, yeah. it's not even like the, the massacre that occurs at Port Arthur is is just a foreshadowing of what's to come with Japan. But also their tactics, their strategies, their strength is just like a it puts the world on notice. And if you've ever studied anything to do with Japanese history in particular, Japan has long periods of isolationism mm. followed by rapid advancement to the point where they surpass everybody, mm. and nobody's aware of it until they suddenly roll everything out and go. Oh, by the way, bang. And this was one of these situations where there'd been isolationist, 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 bang. By the way, we're now more advanced than you could ever dream of. Yeah, after the Meiji Restoration, it takes them some 40 years to catch up to the United States and then exceed the European powers in the next 10. It's amazing how quick they do it. But they they, they single-handedly beat Russia. Russia then, in the sort of wake of this all of a sudden has the first attempted uprising that Lenin thinks was their one shot for a revolution yeah. and misses it. Um, there's this revolt. He handles it so badly in putting it down. <laughs> it sort of reminds everyone of just why they want to get rid of him. Yeah. Um, so they're looking for something to unify the Russians. And to begin with, this is the thing that does sort of play, say, a lot of the peasantry uh, and the sort of this new sort of very thin middle class that's emerging because of industrialization and reform in Russia, it does sort of unify them around this idea, which isn't that it's the czar, it's the war in Russia. But then as it just goes so wrong, all of a sudden you get the uh, locked train speeding <coughs> through Germany across the front, Lenin's plopped promptly on there. Uh, on Russian land, and there goes Russia very, very quickly. Yeah, and again, no, not not part of the start of the war, but Russia does have an opportunity to potentially avoid the whole idea of the revolution when the temporary government comes in place, and they could potentially have got them out of the war and possibly saved everything, and they bungled. Yeah, well, just Lenin's smarter. <clears throat> One man is smarter than the whole provisional government in that he goes, we need to control this post office, and this train station and the whole country will come to a grinding halt. So let's take this post office, let's take this train station, and the country comes to a grinding halt. Exactly. So I think what we've been able to prove is there is no one cause of World War One, and this was pointless. No, actually, I think what we've been able to prove is that the machinations 
around World War I, there is a reason why it is so complex. There is a reason why there is not one uniform view of what happens with World War I. And there's also a really obvious reason when you look at all of this, why World War II happens. Mm. Because I don't care who you are, there is no one conflict that is going to resolve all of the issues that World War I drags up. Mm. And so even beyond the war guilt clause, which you know is the main thing used to start World War II, there is no way that all of the issues that get dragged up in the run into World War I can possibly be resolved by a war that takes place predominantly in several hundred miles of space in France. I just don't believe that that was ever possible. Mm. So I think that between the rise of Germany, German militarisation, um, a couple of empires that are crumbling that are trying really hard to have their great last stand in the Ottomans and the Austro-Hungarians who are trying to make their last stand, the Russians who are trying to secure power, knowing there is this undercurrent building within the country of class warfare, which you raised before, so that's coming through. Mm. The French who are trying to remain relevant um, and trying to make sure that they're not seen as being a fading power. And Britain, who is just trying to remain the dominant economic power and the dominant military power, but at the same time doesn't necessarily want to use all of that because they just want to keep wealthy. You can't resolve all those issues in one fell swoop. Mm. And that's even before you get into the development and the rise of America, which, let's face it, they weren't there for the start, so who cares? <laughs> so, and with that in mind, I think we've pretty much covered a huge portion. Have you got anything you wanted to close with? It's only that the way we've we've told the outbreak of war does seem to be shifting in and off itself in the way that history's been writing. So the, the most recent sort of narrative or maybe meta-narrative even of why World War I broke out seems to, that, that does encapsulate all of these reasons is that it's this new, with the modern, with, with modernity coming to the front, it seems to be that there's a bit of a trend in history to say that this is the individual coming to terms with the possibilities of how they will relate to the state yep. and that World War I is the culmination of too many tensions existing between different ways of ruling and that only after it, and when I say after, I'm talking about after World War II, is this idea of a liberal democracy um, and the, the sort of thing that unifies all the rest of the world as opposed to these varying different ways of an individual state relationship. And not for me to go too Marxist about it, but it really is a reaction of class versus class. Yeah. It is, because you've got the old old world ruling powers. This is their last big flourish. Now, think about it. When you get to World War Two, you're no longer dealing with these, in the majority of cases, these old monarchies that are, are coming to war. You've got said democracies. You've got. I mean, the power of the of the king, for example, in England, is far diminished from what it was at this point PR in time. Figure, yeah. PR completely. Um, and so you've got this situation where in Britain, it's it's not so much the king declaring war. In Germany, the Kaiser's gone by this point. It's Hitler. In Russia, you've got Stalin, um, Mussolini in Italy. You've got these men who have r risen through the ranks of sort of the democracies of the time and either usurped the democracy in, in the case of a Hitler who used it to get where he needed to be or Stalin with the communist system who uses that system to be able to secure his power. But it is more... World War One feels more like the, the, the aristocracy sending the lower classes in to die for them. And it's the last sort of war that, for me, really feels like that. Yeah, it's the, it's the Napoleonic Wars yeah. with industrialisation mixed yes. in. That's and, I mean, World War I is, World War I is the death of a lot of the old-fashioned old warfare to start with. You know, the old-fashioned warfare, it is the last of the old-fashioned wars and the first of the new wars in, in the same breath. And things like the, the annual, if you've ever studied it, things like the advent of the machine gun. Mm. And old world strategies up against guys firing machine guns, for example. That doesn't, you know, marching men in a straight line across a battlefield when the other it. side has a machine gun is not smart. But it takes this war to prove it. So there are lots of things that are proven in this war that mean we get to a new style of conflict mm. in World War Two, And that also involves the... Who are the active participants and who has the say? Mm. And so I think the cause of World War I has many different outlooks, as we've seen. Class is a big part of it. It's a huge part of this. Um, and old world, old world powers having their last great grab to maintain relevance in a world that was gradually going to go past them. 
Um, so with that in mind, I think we've managed to summarise World War One as much as you can. Summarise something. So let's go with that. So thank you, Thomas, as always. Thank you. And we will catch you all on the flip side. Bye. Bye. Bye.